Gig Gab, the show for working musicians, episode 277 from Monday, October 26th, 2020. Folks, and welcome to Gig Gab, the show by, for, and about working musicians. Here in Durham, New Hampshire, I'm Dave Hamilton. Here on the beautiful central coast of California on a fantastic fall day, it's Paul Kent. Ah, we had a fantastic fall weekend, and now we are having a traditional rainy fall day. But, you know, it's it's all good. Like, I'll probably light a fire tonight, and, you know, it'll be... It's the fall. That's how it's how it goes. It's good. Which you know, it's the fall means something different out here than yes. it does back there. <laughs> <laughs> that is true. <laughs> yeah. I mean, I think it's gonna be about 73, 75 today, and you know, <laughs> sun's out and it's beautiful. And uh, but it's not 85, and so right. you know, right. So be it. That's good. How's things going? Things are good. I'm a little um I'm a little stressed today. I have um <laughs> I, I actually have three performances this week all in the same spot three performances and one rehearsal all all four in the same spot so at the seacoast rep theater uh i weeks ago maybe even more than that but probably uh, probably just weeks ago my friend george texted me and said hey uh can you sub for me for two nights for nonsense and I looked at my calendar and, hey, no surprise. Look, I, those nights were open. So that's Thursday and Friday. So I said, sure. I said, how difficult is the show? He's like, uh, you throw me to the wolves. He's like, no, 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 no. It's fine. And then <laughs> um, and then we have uh, Madhouse, uh, at the same theater on on Halloween, on, on Saturday night. And it actually has come together. I wasn't sure, you know, pandemic and all, if that was even going to work. And it looks like it's going to work. So I think we have our rehearsal for that on Wednesday. But this morning I went through, I started going through the, uh, the music for nonsense. I got the book from George, maybe on Friday, we were out of pocket all weekend. And so this morning I was like, I, I got to dig into this. And it, it is, there are more wolves here than George, uh, than George led me to believe <laughs> in that there is a lot of music it is all very like quickly paced, but also the pace of the show is very quick. There's a lot of like stops and hits and, you know, various little things that would be really nice to be able to rehearse my way through uh, without a crowd in the room <laughs> as opposed mm -hmm. to with a crowd in the room. Uh, the band is on stage for this, so there's no opportunity. For, hiding. Yeah, there's no hiding. Right. That's really what it is. There's no hiding, Paul. Normally, I really like being on stage. For this, I'm I'm a little anxious about it. Um, the good news is that, and, and this is very much driven by the pandemic, because otherwise they'd never get the rights to do this. They have the rights to stream this. And, of course, they've been streaming various things from this theater since, like, April. And so they've really figured it out. And... Um, They've got multiple cameras going. They've got somebody managing the shots. It's like, it's a whole, it's a production and the sound is good. So I have the benefit of sitting here rehearsing this along with the people that I'm actually going to be doing the show with in three days or whatever. Yeah, I guess it's three days. Uh, so at least I'm not just rehearsing to a tape of someone else doing, you know, that's like the cast album or something, which is yeah. never, never the same. I mean, it's close. But it's not the same. And with these cuts and breaks and stops and, you know, it's a comedy show. So timing matters. Right. Mm. Yeah. And they're fast tunes. It's a lot of little, you know, it's typical Broadway stuff, maybe typical modern Broadway stuff where it's. But you're it's familiar with the, with the music to, as a foundation or you've never heard this before? No, I've never heard it before. I mean, I started Whoa. listening to it last week. I have a process where I just like while I'm doing other work, I will put music on in the background to just sort of let it flow in by osmosis so that when I do sit down to learn a song, it's like, Oh, this is somewhat familiar to me. It, you know, it, it works. It's, it's my own you know, thing. It's funny. But, I, you yeah. know, as you're saying this, I'm, I'm reflecting yeah. on, you know, like subs that I've used for things or people who have said, Hey, you know, I'd love to do an acoustic show with you. And they'll sit down and they'll, they'll largely sketch out 30 songs, you know, and, and, you know, come kind of, you know, close enough to get to a gig, right? Sure. That's 30 songs, one, you know, and someone can do that. But to get my band, you know, to, you know, really polish off 10 new songs in a, in a, in a winter to get ready to tour with, you know, that, isn't that yeah, weird? You know, it is weird. I, it, it, 
We, in fact, you know, we have get, a question coming up from a listener that we'll get to in a minute here, which addresses some of that in a, from a different angle. But but yeah, it that is interesting when when you have when you're treating a gig as a sub or even a new band member, right? Like coming in, it's like, oh yeah, I'm gonna go and and I'm gonna you know I got to learn these tunes like that's just how you know group group dynamics are just a very weird thing. Uh, Mary Ellen came down and visited this weekend, and we did a little stream last night. It was really fun. Nice. And I was just kind of thinking uh, about, you know, in my change here and, you know, I'm kind of down here by myself and not in the same dynamics with the house rockers or with acoustic madness. Sure. And so I've been kind of woodshedding in my way on what I want, you know, for that type of thing. And I actually have found some new growth in my chops, you know, and, and, and I think I attribute it to just getting out of the familiar you know what I mean? Oh yeah, that's Just, one of the things I love about like this this week. I mean, I I, I said I'm anxious about it. That, that is 100 percent true. <laughs> but I, you know, I also like the. Ex- I'm looking forward to that moment Thursday night. I know we're going to have a, at least a mild train wreck that that we are aware of certainly. But it's one of those things. I know to trust the piano player who's there's two piano players. They are both music directors at different times. And in this show, only one of them is music director because that's how it works. Uh, But I know them both. I've worked with them both extensively. And I know like there will be a moment where it's like, oh, I need to stop and let them, you know, continue plowing down the road and I will catch up. And that's just how that's going to have to be. You know, hopefully that doesn't happen, but like, it's definitely going to happen. (laughs) There's no way without a rehearsal. Back your mind. Yeah, Yeah. Back your mind. But it, it like, there are certain music. There is one music director, really. To be fair, I, I don't want to. I don't want to downplay any of the, the value of any of the other music directors that I work with. But there is one music director, this guy named John Burst, that I worked with at, at UNH for a while and and at other theaters too. And he is, um, like, I don't know how he does what he does, but I've always said he could cue me through a show that I've never played before and don't even have the music for. And I think that's probably true. Like he is able to play very complex piano parts because that's generally how it goes, right? The music director is also, you know, the piano player and, and call out measure numbers, cue people at times. I mean, it's, it's like the guy's mind works on four different levels simultaneously. It's amazing working with him. He is not the music director for this show. And I texted him earlier today and I was like, I, we have a fine music director for this. It, it's it's going to be great, but I I wish it was you because I'm feeling like I might be fed to the wolves a little bit here, and I wish I had the you know your skill in in that department. But he it's a it's more it's more of a skill than it's more a talent than a skill. He just like it he is innately able to do what he does, and it I I don't understand it. And I've talked to other musicians about it too, and they're like, oh yeah, that dude's like freaky how he can do these mm-hmm. things. But it I, you know. I wish I had that for this week. I don't. And it's fine. Like I said, I'll, I'll get through it, but it's, um, it's a little much. So it's fun though. It's the first, first reading I've done in probably a couple of years now that I think about it. And it's reading come right back to you. Turns out it does. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> We're going to see. <laughs> yeah, no, it, like I've already played through the show once I did this morning or most of it this morning. And it was like, oh, wow, look, yeah, I haven't read music in a long time. OK, well, let's see what happens. You, you know, and there were some fast passages where it was like, I've got to go back and look at what 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 that mess on the page actually should have been. But, you know, it's four beats. And then and then the next measure is here. And, you know, you either got them or you didn't. How old were you when you learned to read? Um... Well, probably uh, when I started playing the drums at like 14, I was immediately roped into the school band. So I was reading drums at at 14. I had taken like recorder or whatever in school when I was maybe 10. As or, kids do, yeah. As kids do. But like that, like that definitely helped me. And then I started playing piano about two years before I played the drums. I do remember being extremely frustrated when – my music teacher, my piano teacher started teaching me to read on the piano. And I assumed, well, I learned to read for the recorder. This will all come back. And none of it was there. Mm. And it was frustrating. I was like, wait, I shouldn't be starting at zero, you know, but um, thankfully that translated into the drum. So really I've been reading since I was about 12, I guess is, Uh is where it comes from. And, and, and then obviously more and more complex stuff as, as life got older, but then it's probably ending right about, 2021 
I stopped playing things that required me to read. I had one gig, you know, I, I think I talked about how I subbed for Tommy down when we lived in Austin. And so I was probably 25, let's say when I did that. Sure. Um, but it all came back to me. Thank goodness. You know, that, that it, it all came back. Like I even asked, I remember asking my friend Arnie, who was the, the drummer that had me sub. I'm like, how did you know I could read? Because I don't talk about this at all. He's like, Oh, that's a good question. He's like, I don't know how I knew you could read. <laughs> like, mm. Oh, we all got lucky here. But, but then after that, it was, you know, another 20 years uh, before I read, you know, for that next to normal show, which was whatever, five or six years ago, which was a bear to read. But again, it all came right back, but I had helped my kids like read music for their school stuff. So it was never, it, it, not only was it never that far away, but even when I'm playing parts or, or thinking about, oh, I need to learn, you know, this, this, you know, general business tune for a band or whatever, I, I'm always thinking in terms of how it would be written on the page, at least at times. So the, yeah. the constructs of it are never too far away. I mean, they become, you know, they become muscle memory once I've played a song a bunch and then I'm not so much thinking about, you know, what 16th note am I playing at this point? But but as I'm learning them or, or even coming up with parts in, in our, you know, original projects or whatever, I'm, there's definitely some level of that just sort of flowing around in my, in my head. So it should be Good luck with it, man. Thanks. Yeah. yeah. And I also this week I have to prep a madhouse, which I'm not worried about, but there is a time crunch that I've now got myself into that, you know, plus also it's Q4, which is really busy for us at work. So, you know, it's fine mm. though. These are good. Like, I think about, you know, we, there's a lot of talk about privilege in general in the world. Well, yeah. I am very privileged this week to be a musician. To have these stressed. problems. Yes, yeah. exactly. Yep. There's no, it's, it's not a complaint. I'm just talking about it because it's what we do on the show. <laughs> yeah. Yep. Yeah, it's crazy. Well, cool. Uh, anything more from you before we go to, uh, we go to Steve here? Well, a couple of things. So, like I said, I did a stream with uh, yep. with Mary Ellen last night. It was really fun to play with my friend. And, you know, she's so good. I mean, again, she's just got a very inspiring voice to me, effortless. You know, even as we're warming up, even as we're rehearsing the couple of songs that we, you know, hadn't played before, it was just, you know, really inspiring and, and really lucky to have a musician like that in my life. Awesome. She just, she makes me better, you know, just That's because great. Yeah. you got to You got to get to that level in order to, you know, not look like <laughs> a rank amateur. <laughs> not be shown you know? up. No, I love, yeah. I always said I loved being, I love, it's not, it doesn't happen always, but it's some, you know, sometimes happens. I love being the musician that, you know, the, the, the weakest musician or the one that is challenged the most when I'm on stage or, or playing with anyone. I like that is my yeah. preferred position because like you said, it forces you to up your game. Yeah, it's good. You get out of your relaxed habits. Uh -huh. right? Yes, yeah. exactly. Yeah. You got to come, you got to deliver. Yeah. 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 Also, I got a new piece of gear coming. So I, I bought this Bose S1 Pro, which is, uh, you know, I've, I've been toting around this Bose tower, you know, for acoustic gigs for a yeah. long time. This Bose S1 Pro, you know, for many gigs, totally got enough bass, great sound. It's a Bluetooth speaker, you know, so I can, you know, pipe, music through it during breaks and you know, that type of sure. thing. Yep. And I just, I just like the fit finish and quality of Bose gear. It just, it just gets stuff done. You know, they're, they're pro sound stuff. So mm. I'm looking forward. I'm getting, should pick that up today and, you know, give it a whirlwind uh, tour, um, do some stuff in the studio. Nice. Um, I, I think I talked to you about this um, zoom L eight mixer. So, now that my friends are starting to come down here and visit me and we're going to start doing some streams, I want to do some streams in different locations on everything from the house here. Sure. And so battery powered gear is interesting to me. So the zoom L eight mixer, an eight track mixer built in effects, decent preamps. Um, it uh, not only will record for you, um, but it also is a, an interface. And so I can basically go right out of this mixer right into, you know, an Apple adapter right into my phone and be streaming. Right. Yeah. This is what, um, when we talked to David Shannon, wasn't he, he used one of these for a little bit yes. for something. Yeah. Right? Yeah. He's a, he's, he's a big fan of it. Yeah. So, and again, it's battery powered so we can go out and you can actually do some remote streaming and, uh, and now have a mix, you know, multiple sources, um, and, you know, and effects and, you know, right into the phone and you're streaming. That's awesome. Yeah. Huh. huh. That makes life. And then you sync it up with your, uh, with your 
with with your camera and yeah that's right you're streaming well the, ca- the camera's the, the camera's video the source phone. and the yeah right uh, yeah and so you know it's, it's really pretty simple to do you know we you and i've been using memo live and i went to use memo live last night for the first time and it changed a bunch of stuff and i was on a one hour you know to stream plan i didn't have time to figure out what they changed i couldn't find my video source and so you know as happens sometimes you know facebook and iphone sources are not its only business and so you know they're they're they changed something. Interesting. So I have to go back and figure that out. Yeah. I wonder what they, cha- I mean, I use it, I use it every week. So, you know, changes are incremental to me at best, but I don't, I, I'm trying to think of what any of the sort of fundamental changes that they've made recently would have affected you. I mean, it doesn't mean that it didn't affect you. I'm just trying to, you know, I'm, yeah, I'm no, it, yeah, my, yeah. my biggest problem was it didn't find my video source. So, and it was oh. Mimo cam. So, and it was a, and it was you know, going through an iPhone. So they I, have, I, I couldn't yeah, figure out why. they changed some things there that might, yeah, it, it probably would be one of those things where it takes you, you know, 30 minutes to, of, of like a- extra time to just rebuild that. Yeah. So, yeah. Yep. Yep. So just spent a little time futzing. So a little bit of new gear, fun. um, did a stream was fun. Um, my, I got a chance to go to my local guitar store down here for the first time. Really, really good for a small town. It's a really good guitar store. That's I mean, they excellent. have tons of gear, really knowledgeable. The guy who owns it is actually the guy who does the repairs. His, his son runs the shop part of it. Mm. And the guy who owns the store started the store who was an ex touring musician. And it's a, it's a great store. So it's called lightning Joe's guitar heaven in Arroyo Grande, California. Really, really great store. Nice. That is yeah. always such a treat, man, to move somewhere. I grew up where I now realize, you know, was, I, I've always said that, that especially when I grew up there, but I think it's true now in Southern Connecticut, there were just a ton of great drummers and there was, well, there was really one music store that really focused on drums because it turned out that the the owner and his son are are drummers, you know, and yeah. so they they. But it didn't seem weird to me that the music store in my town that was the sort of the default to go to had a huge drum selection. And then you know I moved to Austin and it was like, wait, where do you go for drum stuff here? And even in Austin at that time, it was hard. There was, you know, like one, yeah. then Tommy's drum shop kind of rekindled themselves and came open. But, you know, it's not a given, even being in a music city like that, that you're going to have a great drum shop. And, um, and, and I got really lucky here too, that in Portsmouth, well, they moved outside of Portsmouth, but it's called the drum center of Portsmouth because that's where they started. Uh, awesome. But it's, it's fantastic. And people buy from DCP, you know, all over the country, they have a huge mail order business, which means they're always like their stock is constantly turning over, which is good. You know, obviously it keeps them in business, but also keeps stuff fresh. And yeah, it's, it, that's awesome. I'm really glad that you've got a good guitar store. Yeah, near good you, local, man. good local source That's great. with a, with knowledgeable repairs. Yeah. It's, right. Right. And, and it, you know, I feel good that it's an independent place. Like, you know, I would yeah. never have brought, I would never have brought my stuff to like guitar center, even though they have, Text, you know, I, you know, Simon, I think will bring to guitar center for setups. Okay. If he has to, but you know, I had Keith Holland guitars up in Los Gatos was, which was another great store. Did I take you in there when you, yeah. when you were out yeah, with we, me for that weekend? We borrowed a Cajon from Keith. So that's right. Yeah, that's right. Yeah. Nice guy too. Yeah. Yeah. Great guy. Yeah. So, you know, having that, those kind of resources, whether you play a little or whether you play a lot, just having, you know, knowledgeable people who can advise you, fix your stuff you know, get you on your way, you know, a place to try out new gear. It's just really helpful. Yeah, it really is. And, you know, I will say this, if you live somewhere where, you know, where you're able to play uh, and there isn't a music store that caters to your instrument, man, like that's a great business opportunity right there because it, you will get business. It's just one of those things. If, if you need it, somebody else does too. And, and like, like we've been saying here, the value of that local store, this is one of those things where it really still helps in today's day and age. And, and you would have to, I think in order to grow your business, you'd have to have an online aspect of it too. I think that would just be smart. But that, sure. that local thing, like there's opportunity there, man. Even, you know, I know a lot of people in the pandemic are kind of wondering what next. Well, if you're wondering where to go to get your guitar, drum, you know, whatever, set up and find things and even just find like 
you know, musicians that play your instrument, if it doesn't exist, you can start it. And I, it, you know, there's a good chance of success there, I would think. So for sure. Yep. All right. All right. We got, we got an email, right? We got an email from Steve, uh, who says, um, one of the bands that I'm in, I was the last member to join. They were basically a garage slash basement band, friends having fun, having me on board, completed the band. When I joined, I was just getting back into playing uh, when my nest became empty. Um, and he says he grew up playing uh, all throughout and partially into his 20s. But essentially before, you know, kids, he played in concert bands and theater pits and, you know, all those things in school and then rock bands and wedding bands and all of that uh, stuff. He says no one else in the band that I joined ha a handful of years ago had any experience beyond the current project that I'm talking about. And that experience ranged from four to five years worth of playing to much longer, but mostly just noodling around. The band served a great purpose for me at the time to get the rust off and having a small set list to work on. Fast forward, I've zoomed back into shape and with major focus, lessons and more, I am playing at my best ever. Uh, largely with my experience and help, the band developed into a decent cover band worthy of playing full evening gigs at many well-known live music venues in town. Now the issue. I'm often at a constant state of struggle and agitation with one member of the band in particular. His instrument playing often just murders the quality of the overall band's sound. He is indifferent, if not resistant to things he could do to improve. Most of the things we fix or are going over parts for new songs at rehearsal are for him. Overall, the band is at an okay level to play out, but it takes a constant effort towards that one member to stay that way. It's not going to change, and I find myself often on the edge of wanting to continue or leave. The main members of the band are friends as much as band members, thus preventing any lineup changes. If I leave, the band will take a blow and really struggle. Not that that's my problem, I know. By contrast, with other projects uh, I play in, the members are all excellent musicians. We don't spend any remedial time with members learning parts or correcting over playing, etc., Bands have had multiple changes in members, uh, all for the purpose of getting better and or cutting the dragging anchor. I love the pressure and focus to always bring my best, and it seems to drive me to be a better player. For each of you, and perhaps Paul specifically, how have you dealt with band members that are friends versus musician performance issues where members aren't cutting it? So I, I have my own thoughts. I have lived this uh, in many different ways, but I'm curious since he asked you if you have thoughts, we can start with you. Otherwise, I'm happy to start if you if you're a, if I'm putting you on the spot. So it wasn't clear to me whether he's the only one in his band who is noticing this and has this problem. I mean, he says everybody's a good player, but is he alone in his assessment that this is a problem? Well, let's and assume that, he's the only one that's not accepting of it, because I, yeah. I, I think others might notice it. But like he said, everybody's friends. There's not going to be any changes. So yeah. we accept it. Yeah. We had a guy in the house rockers for a small period of time who, and again, I'm careful when I offer a guy a gig in the house rockers, when we when in a few times over the 22 years that we've had to replace people, I am careful to be very specific about what the gig is, what your role is, yep. what our rehearsal, you know, I try to over communicate what it is. We had a guy come in and I think we took him, he was a guitar player. We took him at a time where we were getting, you know, we needed to make a change. He was a good, he was a fine player. But we didn't vet him on the personality wise and, and we didn't vet him and, and almost from the beginning he came in and he was a problem. I mean, it was just bad fit personality yeah. wise and how it connects to this situation is that after a month, maybe two months, he was like, man, we need to be an original band. <laughs> like the new guy oh. wants to change the whole business. Right. And, um, and it was clear he was not a fit. Right. And sure. so yeah. you know, I, Cut him loose. He never got to the friend zone. Specific to Steve's question, you know, it is a very tough thing. And it, it depends on your goals. I mean, you got to be happy. If you want to be in the friend zone, you be in the friend zone. If you want to be in the, in the, you know, I want to be the best player I can be. And I want to always find people who can challenge me. You got to make that choice. You know, the house rockers are, are, we are all friends and we've been together a long time. I would imagine everybody looks at somebody at some point in time as families do and say, man, you could be doing this so much better. They, they don't say that out loud, but, no, but I'm sure happens. internally it happens. Right. The net net is, you know, are you, 
Are you happy with what you have? So I, you know, I think at the end of the day, you know, I think our, our band could achieve different things with different people, with different approaches, maybe. Uh, right, maybe. Or, right. <laughs> maybe. Yeah. Right. You know, and grass again, is change, greener. Change, yep. Changes are always a risk. And so, you know, I think in the way Steve describes the story, it really has to be, you know, he came in, like he said, newly empty nest and, you know, getting back into it and G isn't as great. And then he's found that his chops and his musical aspirations sounds like, sounds like they're greater. I, I think when one guy wants to put his musical aspirations on the whole band, that's a, that's a fool's errand. That's, that's difficult unless you're the leader, I guess. But um, I guess you're the leader. Absolutely. Even to, then, right? Like you still need people that match well, you. You right. need buy-in. Yeah. yeah so buy in. Yeah. I would say this, if, if, if your band works and you're working and it's fun, but this, this, um, this classism that often emerges with, with musicians um, is a, like you said, it's a risk that you're going to find the other guys who are going to give you that satisfaction. And what if you find them and they give you the musical satisfaction, but they don't give you the personal satisfaction? What oh, if it's not fun? Right. So, you know, that, that could be awaiting you as well. So I think in all things, you know, I love that Steve Van Zant quote about if you get a band and it works, you know, do everything you can to keep it together. Cause it's such a rare thing. I think that's the, you're right. The, the grass is always greener and you know, some guys see themselves as lone guns who just want to go out and, you know, give their chops. Some guys want to test themselves all the time and find situations th that are out there. Yeah. And that's a, that's a, that's a task. I mean, you know, how do you, how do you go about doing that? You know, do you go to open mics? Do you, do you, do you answer ads for bands that are filling a need? And, you know, are there that many of those, you know, that are the musicianship level that you want in your town that have an opening? Do you want to start something and take on the responsibility of doing all that? So a working endeavor intrinsically has value. And, you know, it may not be everything you want, but you got to decide if you can live with the, the parts that you don't. That well, you don't yeah, want I think it. it I think it will never be everything that you want. I, it, and I, I mean, I say that I've had many bands with which I've been very happy but I could easily sit down and pick, you know, four things that I, I, I do not get out of that particular lineup. And the reality is it's nearly impossible. I have not found. So perhaps it is impossible, uh, but I'm not ruling out, you know, but it's impossible to find that one project that gives you everything. It just for me, my my interests are too varied in order for that to be realistic. Um, I, his idea. You're right about the classism. It's interesting you brought that up because. That does exist. I liked that Steve really identified this concept of remedial rehearsal. Like that is a, a pinpointable problem, right? It, you could show up and be like, yeah, these guys are cool to play with, but none of them are as good as me. And, and that comes across, you know, the wrong way, but, but that's just terms of efficiency. You, you could, you could approach it a lot more nicely than that. But the reality is that's, you know, there, there can be that core Right. But but this issue of, OK, we did this last week and now we're doing it again because that guy didn't remember, didn't take the right notes so that you know, whatever everyone's process is to to sort of absorb and digest the things that we learn at rehearsal, the the segues, the tough sections of the tunes, what you know, whatever those things are. That's that's something you could have a conversation about as a band. True, you can. That's right. another aspect of this. Yeah, you can fix things, right? Some don't, things. don't assume that yeah. the guy who might. Well, some things. Yeah. You, you, and 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 you got to figure out what those things are. Right. And you'd think that you know, uh, you know, if the, if your band is so varied that you have one guy, like we have a friend who's had a band who you know they were they they they've been together largely since high school their drummer became kind of an alcohol problem, you know, and he just wanted to show up and do whatever he wanted to do without any commitment to the qualitative aspects of the rest of the band. Uh, you know, I, I think that that's, I, I don't know any musicians who don't, it's not fun to get better. I, I just don't, I don't can't think of anybody I've ever come across who always wants the bar to be low. I mean, especially I, like, like you were saying, you know, you play with people, and it depends on the vibe. If what you're doing is you're shaming the guy 
and, you know, giving him all sorts of barriers to upping his game or girl. Yeah. Um, you know, you're part of the problem. You, you like can, I have, I have been part of the problem. Yeah. No, I, I've, I've realized that before. It's like, wait, you, you know, if you want this, if you want to solve this problem and it involves continuing to work together, then you have to work. You have to begin by working together. Like you can't be at odds with someone. Like if they, if you need them to get better, either at playing or at the, the, the art of playing in a band because the two are, are different, right? You, you know, yeah. and, and, you know, being better about learning how to take those notes so that the next time and learning how to think about, Oh, this is how we put these segues together. So that like, that's not how do I play like Eddie Van Halen, right? Like there, there's two very different things there. And, yeah. and, and that can be worked on, but like you said, it, it's, it's a together thing. You have to, you have to be part of the solution, not part of the problem. I will. So I, I will say this, but it's entirely possible. I'm part of the problem here, but um, I have, I am fairly confident in telling Steve that this person in his band will likely not ever change in this regard. If it hasn't happened yet, it doesn't mean they won't get better as musicians. It just means that their priorities are not on this kind of thing. And it's really hard to change someone else's priorities. If this guy was showing up and being like, Oh man, I just wish I could figure out how to like quickly absorb this stuff. Like you guys do. That's really, that's a solvable problem potentially, right? Cause you have the desire to learn. It sounds like this person, I could be like projecting. In fact, I definitely am, uh, you know, projecting that, that this person isn't interested in this. And I've, I've experienced this, and I compartmentalize it in my head by putting people in two categories. One, people that want to play music and other people that want to play along with the music. And it sounds like this one guy might be somebody who's just there to have fun and play along. You know, it's like it's like rock band with your friends, you know, but instead yeah. of having Nintendo or going or whatever, I guess we don't use Nintendo anymore. Although that's where I have rock band in the house. It's like the only thing we use it for. Anyway, you know, it's it's not like having your PlayStation, your Xbox or your Nintendo going. It's uh, it's just having your friends playing around you and you're playing along with them. And that's fine as long as everybody knows that that's how that's going to be. And I need to tell you, Steve, that's probably how it's going to be in this band. Well, well, let me pause you here. Try this. Okay. Wipe the slate clean, right? Sure. So there's a, you have a problem. Here's this band. They're my buddies. It's fun. It's good guys, good families, good people, everything. I have this problem I got to solve. How would you solve it? Would you first check with the other band members and say, you know, are we cool with this? You know, is this where everybody wants to be? Or, or, you know, would you want to try and lead your band through, you know what, guys, I want to try and give player X a little encouragement and see, you know, see where he does with it. And, you know, if you guys could back me up on it, I think that would be, you know, like there's a, a myriad of ways to yeah. communicate and attempt to try and solve this or to figure out, you know, like. Who would you rather lose, him or me? You know, like if, if you, you want to, if you want to cut to a bottom line, like yeah. you know, it, does everybody just want this kind of garage bandy thing? I mean, we're getting pretty good gigs now, and we're getting to a place. And the thing is, uh, and this is probably the most important aspect of this, it's usually in the preparation for that talk where it goes south, because you're not, you know, people are not uh, comfortable with the confrontational aspect of it, right? right. So you kind of amp yourself up. You kind of say it with more of an edge than what you mean it you to do. be, right? Oh, totally. Yeah. Yeah. Right. So, yeah. I would, if I were in this scenario and I've been in this scenario uh, and unsuccessfully solved, well, only half successfully addressed the problem. I, the first thing that I would do is individually go, I would have individual conversations with each band member. Uh, the first thing I would do is check in with the other band members, not to gang up on the person who is, you know, no, the problem, check. but a reality check, just like you said. Yep. Hey, like, is it just me that this bothers or is it you too? Because if it, if it is you, if, if it does bother all of us, I think I have a way I'd like to try to, to address this. And that way it takes everybody else out of the confrontation. So you, you figure out where you've got 
buy-in and where you've got people that are just like whatever, or maybe people are even against getting better. And you find out, well, wait, it isn't just that one guy that's the problem. I'm the odd one out, right? But you well, think- but also you'd be careful in this process of going one by one, right? Because what happens is you may get a ton of feedback that you didn't anticipate about every dissatisfaction in a band. So the, the yeah. art and skill of keeping the conversations on track to, I, you know, I think we as a unit will accomplish different, better things. I just want to f- see if everybody's on the same page about this. Yeah, that's, right? That doesn't bother me. I'm, I, I am a control freak. I'm not that kind of control freak. If they're, if we're going <laughs> to, it's a different thing, right? I don't need to control how people are thinking. I, I really do. I would want those. And I have done those where it's a check-in and it's like, but it often, when someone else is like, well, yeah, we have that, but, but, but zoom out a little bit because they might've put a lot more thought into this and they might've been thinking this, you know, about this path for six months and they might have a whole better perspective on it than I do. And, and so I go into those conversations truly wanting that open feedback, but if it does turn out like, yeah, we all think maybe we could solve this. Then I would go have a one-on-one conversation. I would never in that say, we all think you, right? Because now it's, we've ganged up on you. It would be, Hey man, I've noticed a thing. Can we talk about it? And, you know, and, and, and then, and then get into it. Like, Hey, you know, I, I know when we're trying to do these segues or whatever it is, you know, playing these difficult passages, it just seems like you're having trouble figuring out how to learn this stuff. And I would love to help you if you'd like my help, you know, that yeah. kind of thing. And it needs to come from a place of trust. If you've been in the band for five minutes, that's not going to work. Right. You right. know, it, but these guys have been playing together for a while. They have seen success together. And it sounds like Steve is, is from Steve's vantage point, he is, you know, in the, the expert position, right. At probably the other band members see him that way. It, at times as a benefit, at times as a threat, but, but well, there's probably, this, this dynamic that Steve describes that he was right. the last guy to join the right. band. Right. So right. you also, you know, like, Oh, you joined and now you're too good for us. You gotta, you, you know, especially if they're friends, you gotta kind of manage gotta that. Yeah. There's also, you know, a subtlety, uh, you know, an art to um, seeding your friends with the information like, Oh, you know, I would really like us to have a little bit more. And if it doesn't work out, it makes you crazy that you've, you know, it's not all of a sudden a surprise to the guys that, you know, like I'm not cool with it. So there's a way to be like, Oh, you know, expressing, I'd love it if we, you know, if we could be more, you know, I'd I'd love it if we continue to you know strive for more. And then, you know, as people realize that you're, you're not as a unit getting there, if you go start something else or join something else. And again, why can't you be in two projects, you know, be with your buddies for one right. type of, you well, know, it sounds like the- from what Steve said, he, he does play in other projects. So yeah. Yeah. I and, mean, and there's nothing wrong with that. Having the, you know, the group that is the lower bar, but maybe more fun and then a higher bar that's fun in its own way. Right. You know, yeah. it's, you're focused on that. I, I have found, I mean, there's always, it's rare that you're going to, well, <laughs> it's probably never. If you're in a band where you think everybody is of the same caliber, you're probably the weakest member in the band. You're just not <laughs> seeing the Delta, yeah, but that's not a bad thing, right? Like you just, you just don't have enough knowledge to identify why someone else is better. Right. And that's not a bad thing. If you think everybody's playing at a high, a high level, that's great. Like that's perfect. But where I have found this and it seems to be more the rule than the exception is in strictly leader led bands. And oftentimes, in fact, again, I would say more often than not, the leader is the worst musician in the band. And Mm. to me, that makes really good sense. It used to drive me crazy. I was like, wow, why are we like, this guy's dragging us down. It's like, wait, 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 zoom out a little bit. This guy pulled the whole band together. He found people that were better than him to play. Yeah. That's really smart. And his ego clearly isn't into it. it what's that? His ego's not his into ego. it. Right, right. He he just wants to put the best thing out there. And yeah, because of the way this works, he's playing with us. So okay, but he's also the one getting the gigs and he's doing all this. And if we as a band, you know, mutinied on him and said you can't play the gigs anymore, then probably he's not just going to relegate to the position of, you know, booking agent slash manager. Yeah. He, you, you're probably done with the gigs, you know. So it's like you got to be careful with that. Um, it's, just, it, it's very true. But I mean, it happens uh, a, and it, it, it should happen. Right. I actually would say is not to be too harsh with Steve, but that process of being the guy who discovers that someone else is holding us back. That's a very precarious position to be in. 
Yeah. I mean, to, to be the one who kind of like, I, you know, we could be so much more if it wasn't for that guy. That's, you gotta be cautious with that. It's right? Cause that, <laughs> yeah, it's very dangerous. And again, as you sell this to the rest of the band, you have to be so diplomatic in how you kind of explore this. And maybe you don't, maybe, maybe, you know, like I said, another tack to this is in rehearsal, find that sweet spot to kind of communicate frustration. Like, dude, we got to get this down. It would sound so great. You know, you know, we're doing good. We're getting paid, you know, now and and we're getting these good gigs. We're in a good place. You know, we got to keep, you know, we got to sweat the details. And again, the way that you kind of position that frustration there. So one way is to talk to everybody individually, um, and in that, you know, one way is to, you know, see the, you know, I'd love for us to go to higher places together, you know, but we need everybody in and, you know, you delicately do that. Cause remember there's probably other guys in the band that that guy is probably their best friend, right? right. Oh yeah. So for be, sure. Be careful of those interpersonal relationships in a, in a semi-professional band. Another way to do this is to cheerlead through the frustration, Right. Where you identify the problem and instead of Mm. instead of getting dejected in the next rehearsal when whatever happens is happening again and and everything just sort of shuts down. Right. This one guy, he's the anchor dragging the boat, you know, and 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 it's not happening. And instead of pointing at him, you just sort of speak to the group and be like, guys, we are almost there with this. And it is going to be so cool when we're on the other side of this. Think about how we can, you know, I'm a big fan of define the end of the story and then it's easy to get there because you know where you're walking. Right. And so it's like, think about what it's going to be like on stage when we do this and the crowd's going to go nuts because we've done this twist and turn and we've segued these two tunes together. It's going to be awesome. And yeah, we're going to put in a lot of work right now, but if we do it, think about how great it's going to be. And sometimes if you can sell that vision, then everybody will walk the path with you. Right. And, and figure out how to get there. And if, and, and even say, maybe as part of that, even say like, look, let's help each other get there, you know, and, and now it can be a team effort and everybody's doing their thing. It it depends on the, the, the people, it depends on you and your ability to comfortably cheerlead, but that can work really well too. It, it, it's, it's exhausting <laughs> sometimes. Yeah. So, so like everything else, it's, it's an issue of communication and, yeah. you know, being, knowing that where to be delicate, where to be direct, how, you know, and it depends on the group dynamics of your band yeah. and those types of things. But I think somewhere in all this stuff is really helpful. And again, I go back to this guy who was in our band for a while who came in and he, you know, he was the one guy who felt, Oh man, you know, if we play covers, we're just a jukebox. We got to, we got to turn into an original band after being in the band for like six weeks. You know, when you're the guy who, who, who thinks you've solved the band's problems, especially if the band's been going for a while, you are exposed. Be careful that you're going to get buy-in from everybody else. Right. Right. Yeah. The band, if it, if it had, I mean, it sounds like that's less of Steve's issue, but it's a good sort of generic issue to identify. I mean, it sounds like they've been playing together for a long time. Uh, yep. At this point, but still, yeah, it's, you know, it's, a, it's a tough dynamic, but no band is perfect. You know, you get the Steven Van Zandt quote, there's the, there's the one from Timothy B. Schmidt where he said, you know, every band is on the verge of breaking up at all times. Mm-hmm. Uh, it, that is true. Right. And that, you know, we could easily take Steve's description here of a band that's, you know, on the verge of breaking up. Now, it may only be that Steve sees this and we may be reading even more into it than that because it's what we're supposed <laughs> yes. to do here on the show. Right? <laughs> you, you know what I mean? So it's it, you got to always zoom out. And that I think that's what I like about um, having someone that that is as interested as me, as interested as I am in like overanalyzing these things, because sometimes they've done a lot of the hard work for me, you know, yep. and, and in Fling, Russ is that guy. You know, he love we everybody in Fling loves to overanalyze, to be fair. But but you know, for these kinds of things, it's Russ that I will go to first. And because I, you know, my I have like a, a a fuse that's that's like minute, you know. And so I'll like get frustrated about something, I give it like one week, and if it's not solved, then I'm like, oh man, this whole thing's falling apart. 
And I'll go to Russ and be like, hey, man, you know, and fu Russ's fuse is like we still haven't found the end of it. You know, it's still it's so super long, but he analyzes at the same level that I do. And so it's really helpful to have that kind of long view. And he's like, oh, yeah, you know, I'm aware of that. And I'm aware that you're frustrated by it. And I'm aware of this. And he's like, but, you know, think about it this way. And sometimes it's like, no, you're wrong, Russ. I'm going to go fix it. And other times it's like, yeah, yeah, you yeah, know, that's a good way of looking at it. OK, great. You know, but it, it is helpful to have someone you know, a trusted consigliere, if you will. And you can be that for each other. It doesn't always yeah. need to go in one direction, but yeah, you just need to be careful. This is why I like three piece bands the best. One of the many reasons <laughs> you need to be careful that if you find that consigliere, that it doesn't turn into clicks yeah. inside your band. That'll because kill a band. That will kill a band so fast. <laughs> yep. Uh, so I avoid the clicks and like be, I would say be explicit about that. You know, even if you even if you're starting one of these conversations like look, I understand the the danger in having sidebar conversations here, but there's something that's been on my mind. That's really that's really helpful. You, you know, there's yep. something that's been on my mind. I want to talk to you about it, but this is if either one of us sees this fomenting a you know, a a, a bad thing, we can we both either one of us needs to be able to nip it in the bud, you know. For sure. And so And again, I again I, I think the point that we were kind of bringing out here often the uh your blood pressure starts going up in anticipation of difficult conversations and the conversations come out different than the way you have planned them in your head yeah. you know just in the anxiety of having to talk about something that may be difficult so you kind of have to have to you're when you, whenever bringing up something that's difficult you kind of have to if you're not a naturally good communicator and i don't know whether steve is or not but if you're you know if if conflict makes you uncomfortable Oftentimes the, the conversations go south because of intent that starts to come out in the, in the difficult message that you're communicating. So you really kind of have to have your cool together in order to, to bridge these things. But I would also say, you know, as you are saying, you got to weigh all things, right? You know, the, the search for the perfect musically satisfying band on a semi-professional level. Even on a pro a level. Search. I mean, you look at, right? you know, most pro bands that last – and the, the, you know, especially the creative forces in them, you know, the people who are doing the, the bulk of the songwriting often branch out, even when there's nothing wrong, like the main band stays together, you know, you'll see people branch out and, and do yeah. little side projects. And it's because there's no one perfect little panacea. You got a good thing going. Don't mess with that, you know, but it's okay when, when everybody's, you know, when, when that's not taking up your time, cause it's your, now it, that's your day job, right? It's okay to have little side projects and there's nothing wrong with that. In fact, it's it is normal. not a, a, it is not a non noble pursuit to try and lead in your band and model the type of behavior you want to see happen in your other bandmates. You yeah. know, it's, it's all in the way that you do it. So sometimes it's verbally, sometimes it's like, Oh man, I learned this solo note for note. I want to play for you guys. I'm just so excited. You know, I think it's really going to go over well. And sometimes you lead by example. Sometimes you lead by, by, you know, being inspiring and, you know, saying the types of things that'll get, and this is any group, even though yeah. it's a bunch of friends getting together, that's group dynamics as leadership matters and it helps to get over hurdles in different ways. So I, I would, A, not assume it's a lost cause until you kind of explore and poke the poke around the edges a little bit. Uh, and, you know, try some things. Because if your band is working and you're achieving and you're getting better, that's that's a lot of data. That's a lot of valuable information to consider. Yep, for sure. Yeah, no, it's good. I, I, this is good. Yeah, it's, it's always tough. There's always going to be friction or frustration at, at about something, you know, and you just got to kind of roll with it and, and, Definitely. and figure out the path. But yeah. Yeah. Good question, Steve. Thank you. Good stuff. Yeah, thanks, I, hope, I hope we at least offered a lot of examples of what not to do. And maybe that, that helps you narrow down a good thing to do. I don't know if we gave any good advice or not. <laughs> <laughs> it's what we try here. Got anything else, my friend? I do have one other thing. One yeah. of the guys in the house rockers is going through some medical things. And I just want to send some love to our, our beloved funky, uh, great friend and original house rocker from day one and a great man. And, uh, just want to send love, support and healing to him. Yeah, man. Well, I, 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 I send my love in that direction too. That's, that, that sucks to have to deal with anything like that at any yep. time, especially right yep. now. So, yeah. 
All right, folks. Well, that's what uh, I think that's what we got for today. Unless you have anything, mm-hmm. anything further. Mm-hmm. No? Good yeah. chat. Good chat. As, as always. always, feedback at giggabpodcast.com. We're happy to dissect whatever you send in. And uh, we're happy to, you know, if you don't want us to share your name, uh, that's fine, too. You know, we can we can do that for you if you like. But make sure you uh, send it in. Feedback at giggabpodcast.com. We love talking about this stuff. Thanks. Oh, Paul, what do we say? Oh, oh, always be performing, friends. Friends. I add the friends. I like that, friends. That's good.